A guy at a dating agency. A single man looking for love. As a prosperous businessman, he can expect calls from potential partners. Yet only three months later, in December 1987, John Canaan, the man on the video, will be charged with murder and rape. Now, do you admire any famous people? Yes, I've admired a few. Um, people like Gandhi. Yeah. Philosophers like Bertrand Russell. Uh, present day people like Prince Charles, who's socially aware, to people like Bob Geldorf. Mm -hmm. um, but I admire them, I don't idolize them. Right. And I think there's a subtle difference. Now, do you have any ambition for the future? Financially and career-wise, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. Yeah. I'm just now looking for what the next thing to achieve. Chilling, I found it very chilling. John Canaan is a liar. He is a cunning, evil man, and I personally believe that Mr. Cannon is Mr. Kipper. The policeman leading Britain's biggest ever manhunt believes the man at the dating agency is the sinister Mr. Kipper, the abductor of missing estate agent Susie Lamplew. She disappeared 16 years ago. You know, you don't take enough photographs of people, and particularly when something awful happens to them. And I meet so many people, and they all say, I've only we taken more photographs. She was very young then, I think I was about 19. That was much nearer the time when she disappeared. There she is, and that's very much more like, like her she was when she disappeared. We had a photograph taken together, and it was the last time we ever did. And she uh, almost like a ghost behind me, really, holding me. And I always feel that that's probably what she is a ghost. The last time I saw her was, in fact, just before my birthday. She gave me a marvellous birthday present uh, in a hotel and gave me to the theatre. And she wanted to know all about it. And we sat down and chatted and talked. She was doing such a lot of things. And she'd had a wonderful time uh, windsurfing. You know, like all mothers, aren't you ever doing things? Sorry. And she said, no, Mum, life's for living. And I walked with her to the car. I do remember waving and... Um, the next day, it was just as though she'd been rubbed out by rubber. Susie Lamplew disappeared into thin air on a beautiful summer day in July 1986. She left the estate agents in Fulham, London, where she worked at 12.30 p.m. one Monday to show a client a property. According to her diary, he was called Mr. Kipper. There's been no sighting of Susie Lamplew since. On the first day of this inquiry, we established three things. One, that she left that office at 12.30 on Monday the 28th of July. Two, that that night we found her car at one minute past 10. And thirdly, that she hadn't been seen since. They are the only three things that we actually know. Despite the enormous amount of work that's been carried out, the thousands upon thousands of phone calls that have been made, Tiny fragments of information about a man who might have been with Susie that day have emerged. At the sinister-looking house that Susie was trying to sell in Fulham, number 37 Shorrells Road, came the first sighting. 37 Shorrells Road was where she was first seen by the next-door neighbour, Mr Harry Riglan. He was looking outside his window, and he saw her with a male, about 5 foot 8, 5 foot 9 inches tall, whom he described as immaculately dressed, you know, with a, a good quality shirt and tie and, ja and jacket on. And, and that's the classic first description we get of the person who became to be known by everyone as Mr. Kipper. I have an artist's impression that Mr. Ridland helped compile.
Another witness saw Susie in Shorold's Road that lunchtime with a mysterious Mr. Kipper. He said she was with a man, or a man was nearby, and he was a very smartly dressed public schoolboy type, was the words he used. Um, but the other significant thing was he said he was holding a bottle of champagne. An identikit was made up as a result of this witness information. A man answering to the description of the aristocratic Mr. Kipper may also have been spotted with Susie in Stevenage Road, Fulham. It was here her car was found abandoned in the evening. It was uh, a Mrs. Dakota left her house uh, number 139 and she walked um, along Stevenage Road. And I saw a girl standing, I saw a car. In the car, it was a straw hat, which amazed me because it was quite posh. She also saw nearby a very well-dressed uh, male, suntanned, business suit. It had a short hair, quite brown, brown short hair. It was tanned, it was, very, it was quite good, good looking. Susie's mysterious disappearance without trace in 1986 began 16 years of torment for Diana and Paul Lamplew. Always in the background of their vigil has been the publicity from a clamorous and excited media that has helped keep Susie's memory and her case alive. There was something about Susie that was, uh, she had a, a charisma that caught the imagination of the media at the time. We've kept cuttings ever since she, she disappeared. I think we've probably got every single cutting that, that, that there was. We've got about 20 volumes. And there must be, well, I don't know, a thousand or two of cuttings. The staggering thing is that even 14 years on, she's still able to grab the headlines. We've always tried to tape news about Susie, and this happens to be the first recording of, of Susie of shortly after she disappeared. Dan is very good at expressing what we feel. We almost hope to think that she has, is somewhere with somebody who has abducted her, and that he will let her free. We, and we. that we'll find her. For a mother whose beloved daughter has been missing now for six weeks, the stress rarely shows. Despite her anguish, Mrs. Diana Lamplew types a poignant, moving letter to her daughter Susie, who may never read it or even still be alive. That perhaps it might jog somebody. Do you believe that Susie is still alive? I don't expect to hear a phone call now, no. Okay. Now the service at Old Saints Church this Saturday is a memorial service. Have you given up hope of ever seeing Susie found alive? Oh yes, she has been presumed murdered and she has been declared dead. After ten very long years of allowing Susie to now fly free. Next, police make the first tentative link between the man on the dating agency video and Susie Lamplew. Since 1986, the Lamplews have waited while several police investigations try to discover what happened to their daughter. But there's still no trace of Susie, and for years, the elusive Mr. Kipper appeared to have slipped the net. Now, 16 years on, it appears the original police investigation may have been flawed. From the beginning, the wrong picture of Susie was issued. She's shown with dark hair. On the Friday before Susie disappeared, her hair had been tinted blonde. The police weren't helped by the huge media interest in Susie's case. In 1986, they could barely cope with possible leads that poured in from the general public. People went up and phoned, wrote letters to us um, suggesting possible suspects. Um, and all these you couldn't ignore. Even 16 years after Susie disappeared, the Lamplew family are still bombarded with letters from the public claiming to know her whereabouts. 
Oh, we get letters all the time. We still do. We've had thousands all together. This one, I didn't like it. It's saying I'm writing to you basically to give you advance warning of the capture of your daughter's killer. They, they might be right, and that's where one, one has to read them. And we've now handed them all over to the police. At the beginning of the investigation, the police put all their leads onto an old-fashioned card index system. In the first year alone, the police were handling an amazing 26,000 cards without computers. We used a manual system to record our data. There's nothing wrong with that system. Everybody knew it, uh, everybody understood it, and everybody could access it, and it worked for us. From the beginning, Susie was treated by the police as a missing person, so known criminals were not at the top of the investigation list. In July 1986, at the very time of Susie's disappearance, a man was living in a day release hostel just outside the gate of Wormwood Square Prison in London. He was coming to the end of an eight-year prison sentence for rape and robbery. His name was John Cannan. We did have John Cannon in our system. Um, he just didn't feature uh, highly enough. We researched lots and lots of known criminals um, those with previous convictions for abduction, sexual assaults, murders, um, those types of crimes. So we had him and many, many others in our system as well. And in 1986, the police were handling so many leads from the public, they were seriously overstretched. It would be a year before they realized the artist impression of Mr. Kipper resembled John Canaan. In July 1986, Susie Lamplew was selling in London's frantic housing boom. Meanwhile, John Canaan was leaving his prison hostel each day to work as a porter at a theatrical prop hire company. His work colleagues, unaware he was inside for rape, remarked at his uncanny ability to attract women. We went down to an off-license, and he got into a conversation with the young lady there about wine. He said he was having some people around to dinner little celebration. He said he didn't know a lot about wine, so would you help him choose the appropriate wine? In the course of this conversation, she explained about the wines and told him what her favourite ones were. At the end of it, he bought an extra bottle, gave it to her with all her help, and she seemed quite grateful. Went back there the next week, asked her for a date. She was there. He got it straight away. Some work colleagues of John Cannon uh, and inmates um, recollect him saying that he would go to the wine bars in Fulham, that he had met a girl down there. Um, he was interested in buying a, a property in the Fulham area. Unaccountably, Canaan also had access to an expensive car while he was at the prison hostel. I believe he had access to BMWs. It was his preferred mode of transport, and I believe at the time Susie's abduction and murder that he had access to a BMW. His work colleagues would have known nothing about the much darker side of John Canaan's life. Born in 1954 into a middle-class family in Sutton Coalfield, near Birmingham, Canaan appeared to have everything going for him when he attended the local grammar school. But at the age of 14, he was convicted of a sex attack in a phone box in Erdington, part of Birmingham. Canaan's family was devastated. After leaving school, he became a second-hand car salesman with this company in Birmingham. He even earned the title Billy Liar from his fellow salesman for his deviousness. In May 1978, Canaan married June Vale at a church wedding in Birmingham. He appeared handsome and charming on his wedding day. Perhaps he'd changed. But shortly after this, police began investigating a series of unexplained rapes in the Birmingham area. A mysterious man was visiting houses with for sale signs and attacking their women owners. In 1980, Canaan left his wife soon after the birth of their daughter for Daphne Sargent. Then, in what became his trademark, Canaan beat Daphne Sargent senseless when she tried to leave him. From now on, his key relationships always ended in violence. 
In 1981, his appalling behavior finally caught up with him. After brutally raping a woman in a shop in Four Oaks in Birmingham, John Canaan was sentenced to eight years at the Birmingham Crown Court. He served most of this sentence at Horfield Prison in Bristol before he was moved to the day release hostel at Wormwood Scrubs in London. In 1987, a year after he left the prison hostel and a year after Susie Lamplew disappeared, John Canaan had devised yet another crafty method to find girls through a dating agency. And what do you look for in a person that attracts you? Well, I think apart from the physical mm -hmm. side, um, again, I think somebody who's pleasant, mm -hmm. who's natural, um, who's relaxed, somebody who's calm, you're just not, pleasant, you're just somebody nice. You're not career-orientated. No, 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 no. Well, as somebody who's career-orientated myself, I couldn't mm -hmm. blame them for that. Yeah. Um, no, no, not at all. If would-be partners from the dating agency could be taken in by Canaan's charm, could Susie Lamplew have been deceived as well? In the dark days following the disappearance of Susie Lamplew in July 1986, the identity of Mr. Kipper was still a mystery. The Lamplews, however, did have tiny scraps of information about a man they now believe was stalking Susie. She had lots of boyfriends, but she didn't seem to like this one. This one frightened her. She told us she found um, a man very scary. She told us that he was giving her lots of flowers and that she kept bringing him up. And um, he uh, wanted to take her out. And I said, um, you know, do you think that's wise? Because we're going to escalate. And she said, no, Mum. I can cope, and, and I think that the likelihood is that she was a uh, victim of somebody who was a serial stalker. In those and we days, had, unfortunately, she gave us no information, which to to identify anybody, and well, we didn't. We, um, I mean, obviously, we now wish that she had. And Susie's uncle, Mark Howell remembers a conversation he had with Susie shortly before she disappeared. She was saying that she'd come across somebody who was a real bother to her. She was talking about somebody who was leaning on her in ways that was unpleasant, wrong, and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. She was almost angry, it seemed to me. The police began working on another theory, they believe Susie could have been in a relationship with John Canaan. There is evidence to suggest that Susie resisted the approaches of this Mr. Kipper. And as a result of that rejection, I believe there was a planned attack to abduct Susie, which I believe led to her subsequent possible rape and murder. John Canaan finished his eight-year sentence at Wormwood Scrubs for robbery and rape on the 25th of July, 1986. He was a free man. Three days later, on the 28th of July, Susie Lamplew disappeared. Then John Canaan moved to Bristol and rented a flat near the Avon Bridge. John Cannon was putting himself up as a, a businessman from the Bristol area. Um, why Bristol? Uh, I, I don't know, but certainly he was telling people um, that he was a Bristol businessman. Canaan brought several girlfriends to dine with him at the Avon Gorge Hotel, and it was also here that he met and began a relationship with ice skating star Jilly Page. Later, she would become important to the Susie Lamplew investigation. He would pick women up by using a charm that he had. He did have a certain charm about him. Um, Jilly Page, for example, uh, was in a hotel in Bristol. He was in the same hotel. He was dining alone. She was with a group of people. He caught her eye uh, and then sent a bottle of champagne over to her with a note on it saying, meet me on the terrace at 9.30. She did, uh, and that was the start of a relationship. But Jilly Page didn't know John Canaan was also a vicious criminal. Nine months earlier, he had raped a housewife in Reading. 
Arrested as a suspect, Canaan had managed to wriggle out of the charge. A few months after meeting Jilly Page and using the name John Peterson, he slipped into the suitor dating agency in Bristol to get more women. Now, if you could choose to live in any period of history, which would you choose? Elizabethan. Oh, you would like to go back in time? Yes, I think yeah? so, Elizabethan. So why, what, what's it about the Elizabethan? I think a rough would suit me. Right. Tights and a sword. Mm -hmm. I can see me on some bridge <laughs> or some galleon, bigger pirates. Yes, yeah. I, could, I could handle that. <laughs> At this time, it was hard to believe John Canaan could have been a murderer. He was actually very nice. I thought he was attractive, well presented. He had a smart suit on. And he came across as a very confident and probably fairly aggressive person. But um, I, I did actually quite like him. But John Canaan's life of playboy businessman in Bristol was about to come to an end. A few days after John Canaan made that video, Newlywed Shirley Banks disappeared in the Bristol area. A massive police search spanning several weeks revealed nothing. Then, three weeks later, at Leamington Spa, 80 miles from Bristol, a man was caught trying to rob and rape two women in a clothes shop. It was John Canaan. It was whilst he was committing a, a robbery um, in Leamington Spa that he was arrested. Uh, and it was discovered that there was a connection between him and the murder of Shirley Banks. Shirley Banks's body was later found miles away in Somerset, her skull crushed by a rock. It transpired that John Cannon had abducted Shirley Banks, sexually abused her and subsequently murdered her uh, and disposed of her body down a, a, a small ravine. John Cannon had held Shirley Banks in his flat near the Avon Bridge for 18 hours before murdering her. Canaan had been caught because of a vital clue found in his briefcase. A, a small scrap of paper had been found, which, when it was unravelled, turned out to be the tax disc off of Shirley Banks' car. With that scrap of paper also came the first link between John Canaan and Susie Lamplew. John Cannon had taken the, the mini motor car belonging to Shirley Banks and put it in his garage. He had crudely repainted it that significantly had changed the number plates. And the number plate he changed from HWL507N to the letters SLP386S. That to us was very significant. Clearly the letters SLP could have stood for Susie Lamplew. Had the killer of Susie Lamplew at last been found? In 1987, there was no direct computer link between police in Bristol handling the Shirley Banks case and the Met in London. The first connection between John Canaan and Susie's case was made by the Lamplews and the media. It was through the likeness of the photo fit that we had issued. It was John Cannon's likeness to that, that there was speculation again from the media that he could be the mysterious Mr Kipper. Mike Barley and other detectives hurried from London to interview John Canaan in Bristol but the Met officers knew they had little concrete evidence. I was talking to John uh, about the Mini that belonged to Shirley Banks, and in particular, the number plates. I remember saying to John, why had he chosen the letters SLP, and did he understand the significance of those letters? And he said, yes, he did. And I asked him to explain. And he said, I understand that could be interpreted as Susie Lamplew, the letters SLP. And again, I said to him, explain the significance of those letters. He said, I bought that car off of a Bristol businessman for £100. He said, that man is in a lot of trouble. I said to him, John, you are in a lot of trouble. You're in prison. He said, yes, but he said, that man committed the murders of Shirley Banks, Susie Lamplew, and another girl. And I said to him, is that man you, John? And he said, yes. He then said, no, 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 and retracted it very quickly uh, and stood up uh, and we had a break because he was very emotional. And I went outside and said to my colleague, he said yes, he said yes, 
and Mike was quite excited about this, but I have to say I, I wasn't. I mean, I'd, I, I don't want you to think I'm being negative on this, but I genuinely thought that he made, had made a mistake. And after a few minutes, we went back in there uh, and tried to recover the moment, but the moment couldn't be recovered. But I actually believe, and honestly believe, that for that very brief moment in time, that John Cannon was telling the truth. In 1989, John Canaan was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Shirley Banks and the rape of the Reading housewife. The trial judge told him, you should never again be at liberty outside of prison walls. But Bristol police running the Shirley Banks case had been anxious to distance themselves from the difficult Susie Lamplew investigation. The Metropolitan Police had looked into the, the missing girl, Susie Lamplew. They, in fact, interviewed Cannon about it, and uh, I know that they've spoken to you, to you about it. My understanding is there is no evidence to connect him at the moment. I've been asked of any connection between Mr. Cannon and a Miss Lamplew. We're all aware of the speculation that has been in the recent past. So far as my client is concerned, his instructions are that he has never met the lady. They had only circumstantial evidence, but the Metropolitan Police continued with their attempts to get Canaan to confess in prison. It turned into a battle of wits. John Cannon was very experienced at being interviewed um, by police, clearly because he'd been arrested many, many times during the course of his life, and knew how to turn uh, an interview. He made sure he found out the, the Christian name of the interviewing officer, the detective chief, and kept calling him by his Christian name. So he would use any chance that he could to turn the interview around. In one interview, for instance, tea was served, and he took charge of serving tea. And of course, in asking whether sugar was needed by either of the interviewers, and one said yes, he t gets the conversation to a personal level by saying things like, you don't look like you're the sort of person that needs sugar, you're not overweight. It put the in interviewing officer at a disadvantage. And also, Canaan kept asking him questions, which he then started answering. And there was one point where he was actually having to defend the way he'd been conducting his investigation. I think he thinks he's more intelligent than he is. Um, I noticed during the interview, he kept using a particularly long word, thinking it meant something else. I'm just looking now, I'm in a sedimentary period, yeah. where financially and career-wise I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. I'm in a sedimentary period. I'm in a sedimentary period. There was a place actually in Peru called Machu Picchu, some ruins, Inca ruins, mm -hmm. Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu. Even in prison, it wasn't like interviewing someone who'd been sentenced to life imprisonment. You know, it was, he treated it as though we were meeting in a pub over a pint. Psychiatrists have had a look at John Cannon, um, and one of them quite poignantly said to me that this is a man who can dispose of a human life with as much emotion as you and I throw away a toffee wrapper. Without the discovery of Susie's body, it's been impossible for Diana and Paul Lamplew to put the tragedy behind them. We've been all through telephone calls with people saying, um, by the way, uh, we have a corpse here. Has your daughter got uh, gold teeth? And then we've had another one saying, um, we've got parts of her body here, skin. Uh, how long were her legs? That's very tough. But quite suddenly, in 1990, the family had a lead on Susie Lamplew's possible whereabouts. The ice skater, Jilly Page, who had a relationship with Canaan in 1987, remembered an incident. On one occasion, John Cannon took Jilly Page from Bristol to Birmingham, up, to, up the M5 motorway. And during the course of the journey, the discussion came round to Susie Lamplew. In fact, I believe it was John Cannon who started the conversation. 
they were driving in the area of Norton Barracks, uh, and he pulled in on the side of the road, and he gestured into, the, into an area and said, oh, that's where Susie Lamplew is buried, or, or words to that effect. And shortly after that, John Cannon took Gilly Page to um, what appeared to be a, a deserted army barracks. I later visited that area, um, very large, um, overgrown, deserted, uh, disused barracks. Um, I was so taken with the possibility that um, something could be there that I drove into the local town and bought a, a disposable camera uh, and went back and took some photographs of it. On his way to the barracks, Canaan had told Gilly Page, do you want to go where Susie went? The conclusion that we came to, that it was a viable prospect to search Norton Barracks for, the, for human, human remains. Canaan also told Gilly Page that his nickname was Kipper because of the Kipper ties he wore. It would, of course, be incredibly expensive. It would be very manpower intensive. And the decision was made that the evidence was not strong enough to support such a large and costly operation. With no confession from the imprisoned John Canaan and without Susie's body as evidence, the police, by 1990, were no further forward. Apart from the extraordinary coincidence of the Mini's number plates, the case was going nowhere. During the 1990s, the Susie Lamplew investigation slowly wound down. But if the police had almost given up, the Lamplew family hadn't. I was trapped, and that adds up to a huge energy which is not expended. I, I really can't describe the adrenaline which rushes through you. And that adrenaline's there to go out and find your child. You want to get out there, you want to shout, you want to scream. Frustrated at the lack of progress in the investigation, Susie's family had channeled their energies instead into setting up the Susie Lamplew Trust. And we've got a letter from Susie Good morning, Susie Lamplu Trust. This is a national organization born out of their own loss that campaigns for a safer society. As a result of what happened to Susie, the Trust campaigns to reduce violence against individuals at home and at work. We work for everybody for people out and about, that's you, me, our kiddies, grannies, etc. We work for children in schools, we work for people in the workplace. For all those people, we have um, a complete range of resources from uh, the very young. This is our preschool books for children under three. Uh, there's Leela, who's lost mummy at the seaside, and there's Jack, who's lost mummy in the shops teaching children personal safety, but also, of course, getting the message across to the, to the parents. Uh, then we have a safer travel uh, booklet for uh, children who are leaving school, who are going out on work experience. It includes uh, information on 236 countries around the world. This is our, our shriek alarm. The whole purpose of an alarm is to shock and disorientate the attacker, and this is precisely The trust is a legacy for Susie. I think it's a quite remarkable legacy. So many people want to do something that is positive after something awful happens. And this was real. We found that education needed help. We looked at transport and that needed a huge amount of help. I do a lot of work on the trains now. And the more you looked at it, the more you realized that we'd unearthed something enormous. Over the years, the Trust has helped shape new legislation on safety in this country. It looks as though it's moving forward very slowly. We put a huge amount of work into uh, stalking and the work to be done there. There's a lot on sex offenders and young girls who are actually abused, sexually abused, or boys who are sexually abused. The thought of why one's doing it undoubtedly drives one along. 
certainly what drives us both along is that in some funny way we're sort of doing it for Susie um, and that does energise one enormously. Next, the clues that lead the police to look for Susie's body. In the year 2000, John Canan was serving life for the murder of Shirley Banks in a top security prison in Yorkshire. It was a long way from his fantasy lifestyle. <laughs> now, is there any other country in the world you'd like to live in? Switzerland. And why, why would that be? It's just a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. It's clean, it's precise. Um, and it's, in, it's the great journey it, it? Well, yes, that's right. Of mm. course, it's, the, it's, it's a fulcrum, if you like, of, mm. of Europe. It's, it's a fulcrum, if you like, of, mm. of Europe. Mm. Yes. Even though he was serving a life sentence, as far as the media were concerned, Canaan was still the chief suspect in the Susie Lamplu mystery. In the summer of 2000, 14 years after she disappeared, the police put a new team on the case. It was part of the Met's policy to try to solve outstanding cases. The new investigation was headed by Detective Chief Inspector Jim Dickey. Our main term of reference, in essence, was to eliminate or implicate John Canen. And the more we looked at it, it was more likely he was going to be implicated than eliminated. And that is true to this day. These are the uh, original card index system. In summer 2000, the new investigating team began by computerizing the 26,000 entries in the original card index system. Um, they're talking about thousands of card indexes. You can imagine the time required to search in any of these, and obviously there's a potential for human error as well. In my view, it would have overwhelmed them. Fourteen years on, the police made a startling discovery. Other estate agents in the Fulham area had been visited by a man calling himself Mr. Kipper. I believe John Canan visited a number of premises in Fulham and probably elsewhere on the pretext of being a potential buyer. I believe it was done with the purpose of to look at pot potential victims for abduction and murder. The original dark haired picture the police issued of Susie was then changed to the correct image with blonde highlights. Almost immediately a new witness came forward. He remembers jogging in Fulham on the 28th of July, 1986, the day Susie disappeared. He saw a woman with blonde hair struggling with a man in a BMW. And I came out of the park to be met by a BMW, which tore across the road, come to a halt with somebody with their hand on the hooter pressing it for a very long time. As I stood there, I saw a blonde young lady. She looked as though she was laughing or she could have been screaming. What worried me, you know, was how could she drive with what was going on? Well, it never occurred to me that it was a left-hand drive car. Although the police searched for years, they never traced that BMW. The jogger had provided good circumstantial evidence, but it was still not strong enough to prove John Canan was the man who had abducted and murdered Susie Lamplu. So next, a decision was made to search for Susie's body. Chief Inspector Jim Dickey hopes would yield a DNA link to Canan. The police began looking at Norton Barracks, first named 10 years earlier by ice skater Jilly Page. It was the area Detectives Barley and Addy had once suggested was worth searching. Well, it's, it's an experience which I'm not exactly looking forward to. I mean, I, I know she's dead. I know she was dead long ago. I don't exactly relish finding out what precisely happened. We might very much we might feel that we were very relieved and we might feel that it was very nice to be able to put Susie to sleep. The team faced the costly task of searching a huge area for a body buried years earlier. The latest police technology, satellite imaging, could in theory show heat from remains or earth disturbances in the ground from 14 years earlier. 
they began a huge five-day search in December 2000. It would be lovely for me to be able to hold her hand and to some way be able to uh, take or share, I think it is, um, the pain that she must have gone through. Because I think every mother feels that they should be there when their child needs help. And we've never had that opportunity. It would be marvellous if we could find her. But somehow I don't have huge hope for it. It's a long time. Because there's such a lot in the case, they want to make absolutely certain. I think we have to answer it. Every phone call to the Lamplus became an ordeal throughout the five-day search. Paul Lamplu? Hi. And how's it going down there? Otherwise? Wet everywhere, yeah. They haven't found anything. Uh, I mean, they haven't found anything of significance. Uh, it's very wet. Uh, they had to dig trenches to uh, drain the land off before they could work. And they dig this by hand. 30 people working there. To be honest, I think they're not tremendously optimistic about finding anything. What's the, the latest on the search? What's happened today? Well, the search is now finished. Uh, they've done everything they possibly could, and they haven't found her. Um, I would be amazed if they could do, because after such a length of time. I hadn't realised quite how disappointed I was until I got a phone call this morning, and I didn't realise how much inside me I was actually hoping. Detectives are questioning a man tonight about the murder of the estate agent Susie Lamplew. John Canan was tonight being questioned at London's Hammersmith Police Station in suspicion of kidnapping and murdering her. In December 2000, John Canan was brought from his prison cell to face an exhaustive series of new police interrogations in London. Detective Inspector Stuart Alt did the questioning. John Canan was certainly not the John Canan that I had seen having viewed the dating agency video. He's put on weight, Clearly he's 15, 16 years older, and the condition that he was in certainly wasn't the smart, uh, debonair young man that he depicted in that, in that video. They've simply told us that it's been going extremely well, and that um, he has been talking. Um, and they're not looking for anybody else? He hasn't been talking about Susie in the sense that He's been saying he's done it. But I understand that they've put scenarios to him which he has discussed. His body language convinced them that uh, it is him. It is literally cat and mouse in dealing with him. But one advantage I had when I interviewed him was the benefit of his techniques from research of his previous interviews. But if Mr. Conan wishes to protest his innocence both for Susie Lamplew and Shirley Banks, we may draw a parallel between those two. We know he's abducted and murdered Shirley Banks, and he stands convicted, and I feel that is the same for Susie Lamplew. They're going to search uh, two other places. There's a place where Shirley Banks was uh, thrown, and um, there's uh, another place which we don't know yet. When John Canan murdered Shirley Banks in 1987, he disposed of her body in a remote area in Somerset, aptly named Dead Woman's Ditch. In May of 2001, it became the focus of another search, this time for Susie Lamplew. 
the police were exploring a new theory based on the figures in the new number plate Canaan had fabricated for Shirley Banks' mini, SLP386S. It could mean Susie Lampelew, the third victim of that year. It could also mean an Ordnance Survey grid reference, which incidentally is very close to a uh, dead woman's ditch in the Hontock Hills. But, in spite of another massive and costly effort, the Metropolitan Police search team found nothing. Then, last summer, the police were able to prove that Canaan was in Fulham the day Susie disappeared. An eyewitness said a man resembling John Canaan was seen staring into the window of the estate agents shortly before she left. We have evidence that could put John Canaan in the Fulham area the day Susie Lampley went missing, and the day prior to her going missing, and in the Fulham area generally. And I personally believe that Mr. Cannon is Mr. Kipper. But in spite of the new evidence, the Crown Prosecution Service, in a dramatic statement, informed the police there wasn't enough evidence to send John Cannon to trial. As a result of the reinvestigation into the murder of Susie Lampley, uh, we submitted a file of evidence to the CPS in June of this year, recommending a prosecution. They recently advised us that they, they felt we had insufficient evidence at this time. This is a defining moment for our family. We are greatly distressed and indeed considerably angered that after all these years, it is still not possible to prosecute the person who both we and the police believe murdered Susie. Mrs. Lampley, how do you feel that Mr. Cannon could be released? I think the most important thing for us is that he should not be able to reoffend again. We are extremely concerned about that. But on the moment as it is, it's a long time. But um, it's for huge concern. I am as certain as I can be without going through a formal judicial process that the, the abductor and murderer of Susie Lamplew is incarcerated in one of Her Majesty's prisons. Over the last um, few weeks, and, um, it's been the first time that I've actually really cried so much. We are presumably completely changed people with a different outlook on life. And, um... People kept on saying that we must go back to what we were. You know, to, to, uh, you come back to where you were. But that's absolutely impossible. We are totally different people. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't enjoy life and that we don't have fun together and mm. learn a lot from each other and... Um, but we're different. I, I, in a funny way, I think we're better people. We're... I mean, I don't know, it's for others to judge, but I like to feel that um, we've achieved more in our, with our lives since Susie disappeared. There are lots of ways we remember her. She was um, gorgeous and we remember her now as she was. She said it's lovely that she made that dress herself. I was looking at that picture just now while Dan was talking and it certainly, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly inspirational.